He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the day of the vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to point unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Hallelujah. Of course, we understand this to be that verse of Scripture that introduced Jesus into his public ministry. This is the verse of Scripture that Jesus read from on that day when he identified himself as the one that would be the anointed one sent from God the Father. The Bible says he read on that day from the book of Isaiah, and he read that first verse where it says, And the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the broken heart, and aren't you glad for Jesus today? To proclaim liberty to the captives as the opening of the prison to them that are bound. The Bible says he closed the book and said to those that were watching him, Today is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. They didn't clap for him, they didn't give us an ovation, they wanted to kill him. Because they thought he was blaspheming the word of God and God Almighty himself. But we know today that this was the fulfillment of the prophecy proclaimed to Jesus Christ. But there's something that goes on there that he began to proclaim that I want you to look at today. When we talked about it, it's time. Praise that I'm about to get my praise on. Hallelujah. Amen. This third verse says, To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joyful mourning, the garment of praise, for the spirit of heaviness. Notice with me very quickly what it says here. It says to appoint unto them that born in time. To give unto them. That's an important phrase there. To give unto them beauty for ashes. The oil of joy for mourning. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. To give unto them. He didn't say he was going to dress you up. He didn't say he was going to be the one that put it on you. It's the same type of word that we find where it says, and for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. In other words, what he's saying is, I've already given you the garment of praise. I've already, already given you the ability to wake up in the morning and open up your eyes and run, recognize it's a beautiful day. I've already let, given you something that will transcend and overcome the situation situation and circumstances that you might face, but you've got to do something about it. You've got to put your praise on. Yeah. He said, I've given them the garment of praise. I have given them the garment. I have given them the garment of somebody. You can hear this today. I have given them the garment. I have given to you the garment. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. It's time that we begin to search out our wardrobe and see what we're wearing today. Yeah. Glory to God. Are you wearing the spirit of heaven? My question to you is, how come? Amen. Now, God never said, I want my people to be down and out and doing without. I call it powers and downers and doing without us. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no, he didn't. He said, I've given them the garment of praise. There's something that we can do. We can get up and change our clothes. Pray that we can change our position, our situation, our circumstances right now. Amen. The problem may not change, but you will change. You'll face your problem differently. You'll recognize, praise God, in the midst of the trouble, you can lift your hands and you can start praising God. You can put your praise on and know that everything is going to be all right. You can have your shout back. You can have your dance back. Praise God. You can realize that everything is going to be all right. I put my praise on. My mind. Praise God. Yeah, that's, that's a good step right there. Praise the Lord. First Samuel. Let's go to 1 Samuel real quick because I'm going to show you something here. See, here's the, here's the situation for the people of God. If we're not careful to understand that we can put our praise on, we, praise God, might find ourselves not having ourselves equipped with the praise on. We might find ourselves just going through the motion. We might find ourselves, praise the Lord, with, with our joy is sucked out of us because in the presence of the Lord, amen, is where the joy is found. Can somebody say amen? amen. And so in 1 Samuel chapter 6, we're going to see here. All right. Let me get this. 1 Samuel chapter 6. We're going to see here something that's important for us to see what we're talking about putting our praise on. Now in the context of 1 Samuel chapter 6. I'm sorry, 2 Samuel chapter 6. 
I'm just testing you today. Stay with me. We're going to put our praise on today. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, we find something interesting happening. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, we find the, this, the chapter opening up in tragedy. Opening up in a situation that's not a good situation for the people of God because God was not in the midst of the children of Israel. They were going through the motions. The ark had been removed for at least, hear me now, 20 years. The ark represented the presence of the God, of the Lord. You cannot have the praise of the Lord without the presence of the Lord. We can come to God with presence. We can come to God with presence and find that His presence is not here. Are you getting that? We present Him presence, and yet there is no presence. And this is what is happening with the children of God. They had been in a battle 20 years prior to that. And they were defeated by the Philistines. And the Ark of the Covenant was carried away. The Ark of God was removed. And the Bible says that Ichabod was written over the tabernacle. Which means the glory of God has departed. You can have a form without the power. You can have a ritual without a relationship. This is the situation that the people of God were found in here in, these con in this context of Scripture. They were going through the motions, but they had no presence of God. Oh, God, help us not to ever be in that place. We, want, we need the presence of the Lord. Without the presence of God, there is no life, people of God. Without the presence of the Lord, there is no life. We can teach you from the Bible, but we need the presence of His Spirit. Hallelujah. We need the presence of God. Amen. Even Jesus himself said, the letter killeth, but the Spirit gives life. Oh, yes. Amen. Amen. So the presence of the Lord was gone from this place. They had lost God. Reminds me of the story of, the, of, of a single mother that had two twin boys. It, it was Jimmy and Johnny. And Jimmy and Johnny were really causing mother a lot of trouble. They were about eight years old and always getting in trouble. And so the mother came to the pastor and said, uh, Pastor, we, uh, would you talk to my boys, Jimmy and Johnny? They're, they're really disobeying a lot. They're getting a lot of trouble. You know, I'm getting letters from the school. Would you talk to Jimmy and Johnny and see if you can help them? The pastor said, well, sure. And so Jimmy and Johnny came on Monday to the church and, and, uh, and the pastor decided he would talk to them one at a time. He says, well, would you send in Jimmy first? And so Jimmy came into the pastor's office and, and the pastor got down and got to the level of Jimmy and looked into his eyes and said, Jimmy, where's God? And Jimmy just looked at the pastor and speechless, didn't know what to say. He was scared to death. And he just looked at the pastor and said, Jimmy, it's okay. You just need to know where's God. Jim, Jimmy didn't say anything. In fact, he started shaking a little bit. And Jeffrey, he was just terrified as he was being questioned where God was. He said, Jimmy, I need to ask you one more time. Please answer me. Where's God? And as soon as he said that, Jimmy bolted out of the pastor's office, grabbed his brother John, and said, Come on, Johnny, let's get out of here. The pastor's lost God, and he thinks we took him. <laughs> the pastor's lost God, and he thinks we took him. This was the situation with the children of Israel. They had lost God. They had lost the presence of the Lord. They had a form. They had a ritual without power. They had no presence of the Lord in the camp because the ark had been carried away by the Philistines. And for 20 years, they practiced their religion. For 20 years, they went through the motions. They, they still offered their sacrifices, but the ark had been removed. The ark was a representation of the presence of God. And so, all of a sudden, David is exalted into a place of leadership. David is now anointed the king of Israel. David has been through his trials and his testings. And David has been found faithful to the Lord. And David is now ascending to the throne of God. And one of the first things that David does, he says, Where is the ark that we may go and get it and bring it back into the city of Zion? He knew that with it, for him to rule and for him to lead, for him to do anything successful as a part of the people of God, he knew that he must get the presence of God back. Amen. People of God, I come to tell you today, we need to get our praise on so that we can get the presence of God back. Not just in our church, not just in our home, but in our community, in our businesses. Wherever we go, we need to...
continue to remind ourselves that I cannot accomplish as much as God wants me to accomplish without His presence going before me. David understood the principle of the presence of the Lord. It was David that wrote, that said, amen, that David said, in thy presence there is fullness of joy, and at the right hand, pleasures forevermore. David understood how important the presence of God was, and so David said, the first thing I want to do is go and get the ark back and bring it back where it belongs, amen, to bring it back into the city of Zion. In the first part of chapter 6, they had a miserable failure. They didn't handle the things of God correctly, and death ensued because of it, because there's some things about God that you need to be careful with. I'm not going to go there today because that's not part of my message. I'm talking about putting our praises on. Hallelujah. Amen. And so we want to start this morning, just kind of look this over real quick, and start with verse 12. 2 Samuel 6, verse 12. Now remember, he said, God gave us the garland of praise. He gave us the garland of praise for the Spirit of Heaven. Verse 12 says, And it was told to King David, saying, The Lord hath blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that pertaineth unto him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. And it was so that when they that bear the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed oxen and valleys. I find that a curious verse of scripture. You need to think about this this morning. Notice what it says here. It says, and it was so that when they that bear the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed oxen and valleys. Why is that? Why was it that every time that they, they had taken six steps, they stopped? Well, I have a reason. I have an idea of why that happened. You see, six is the number of man. Because on the sixth day, God created man. Seven is the number of God. It's the number of completion. It's the number of perfection. Praise the Lord. It's the number of God. Can somebody say praise the Lord? And it, it shows us something. It, there's revelation here. It shows that if God, if God expects us to do our part. God expects us to walk along the way and make our... Make our, our efforts to get close to Him, to get into the city of God, even that we are on our way to getting into the city of God. I wish I had some help with you today. We're on our way. We can only go so far without God. We can do the best we can. We can take our six places. We can do as much as God has given us the ability to do as men and women of God, but we will never go as far as we need to go until we have the recognition, praise the Lord, that I'm not seventh step. In that place, amen, where I lack, I need a God. I need to find the Lord in that place. I'm on my way with Him, but on that seventh spot, in that place of where God will, I need to lift my hands and I need to put my praise on. David said in one place, unless God was on my side, 
surely I would be like that ship, amen, that couldn't make it to the other side. Except God was on my side, I would have sunk when I got out of the boat and tried to walk on the water. But his hand, his faithful hand, his outstretched hand that is never too short, was there to pick me up when I began to fall, amen. Because I can fall and I can feel, but my God never falls and my God never fails. Without him, we will surely fail. Without him, we will be like that ship on the water that is sinking or drifting without a sail. Amen. And so what they've gone six paces, they sacrificed, they lifted their hand, they killed the oxen and the fatlings, which just is a representation of giving our all to God. Giving everything to God. It's the sacrificial offering of saying, everything's go, everything I am, everything I will ever be can be nothing apart from you, Lord. It'll never be nothing apart from you, Lord. And so it's just self-sacrificing of ourselves. But the first 14, verse 14 says, And David danced before the Lord with all of his mind. And David was girded with a linen ephod. David was caught up in such a celebration when he began to recognize that he was ushering in the presence of God into the place where God belonged in his life with his people in his city that he got so excited he just began to dance before the Lord with joy. Praise God. He began to tear his clothes off and get new clothes on. Now, I know you're crazy around here. But don't get that crazy. Yeah, he, he just began to strip himself and began to put on the garment of praise and dance before the Lord. He was lost in the spirit of God. He, he got caught up in the midst of the glory of God. He was in the midst of the glory of God and he was just dancing before the Lord. He was celebrating the presence of God with all of his mind. Kind of like what you guys did here today. Celebrating God with all of your mind. That's what God wants us to do. Amen. When you come into the house of God, he wants you to strip away every preconceived idea and thought that you might have. Many times people in church life rip themselves off because they come into the house of God with preconceived ideas and imaginations. They think about a certain way a thing needs to be done, how long the pastor should preach, what songs need to be sung, and who is there and who is not there. It's like, you know, you sometimes you see more rubbernecking in the church than you do on the street. Christians. I should have called that service. I should have called that message brother Nick. But anyway, let's go on. And so he danced before the Lord with all of his might full of joy. And then I want you to know he got lost in the spirit of God. That's what we want to do. We want to lay down every preconceived notion and idea and know that we come, when we come into the presence of the Lord, God is getting ready to do something big in your life. We didn't come into the house of God just wondering what is God going to do in my life today. What is God going to do? I'm coming to the house of the Lord. I don't know what God has in store for me. And without doing that, you find yourself just going to the motions. It's kind of like that Ichabod moment. Because you've ripped yourself off because of preconceived notions and ideas. And you leave the house of God the same way that you came in. That's bad enough. But the things that go with it is that you begin to get suffering the life out of you and your joy gets depleted. You're here today, there's some here today that need a restoration in your life. You need a revival in your soul <laughs> to get back the part of the presence of God in such a way that it saturates your soul so that your joy is renewed. Amen. The joy of the Lord, Nehemiah said, is your strength. If you come in the house of God today, weary and beat down by life and the things that are going on and circumstances in your home, I'm here to tell you today that God has invaded your presence just like he did with David. The ark of God has fallen in this house, the very presence of the Lord, to fill you back up with that first love, to fill you back up with the joy of your salvation. David danced for the Lord with all of his mind. Amen. He should begin to strip off all of the outward things that was hindering his life. And some of you here today need to strip yourself off of all the outward things that has hindered your life from 
get into the very center of what God is wanting to bless you with today. Amen. He really, really does. Don't worry about what people think or what people might say. You don't have to worry about that person that next to you. You need to strip away those things that are hindering you from getting all that God has for you today. Amen. Michael, David's wife, watched David as he came into Zion. Here David danced before the Lord, just saturated with the presence of the Lord, being filled up with the joy of the Lord. And he was ridiculed and he was, he was despised in her eyes because she said, you are being a fool dancing like that before all the maidens had become marching here. There will always be somebody, there will always be someone or something that will want to try to get you to be hindered and not receiving all that God has for you. But David said, you think that's bad, you just watch me now. <laughs> you think that was something, you just wait till tomorrow. Now that, that's thanks to translation there. So you'll we'll find that in maybe about the bookstores, but you never know. You never know. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying today that David, God wants you to put your praise on. God does not expect you or even desire for you to be discouraged. He doesn't want you to be down. Amen. Matter of fact, a Christian should never be down. A Christian should never be down. You should either be up or getting up. Did you get that? A little play on words there. You know, some people are down and they stay down. God doesn't expect you to stay down. You're either up or you're giving up. It's time to dust yourself off. It's time to shake off those heavy bands. It's time to receive the word of the Lord. It's time to let God deliver us from the shackles that hold us back. It's time to get anointed with a fresh anointing. It's time to understand that God is saying, I'm in your midst. All I want you to do is lift your hands and start praying. Amen. Don't worry about the person on your right or on your left. They might go through a hard time and they just don't get it. They don't want it and you're not going to do anything about it. <laughs> they don't get it. They don't want it and you can't do anything about it. So God doesn't care about them. God doesn't care about them. That in your life. What he cares about is you. Amen. You and him. So don't let that person on your right or your left affect you today. I see people come to church. And they literally start getting held back by someone that invited them to the church. You don't want to be there. Don't you? Yeah. It's crazy up here. <laughs> you get the glory of God up here. Something will happen to you up here. What I'm telling you today, God's getting his time. Get your praise on. If you'll get your praise on today before you leave this church, He will refill you with joy, excitement. He will refill you with the love of Jesus that wants you to just go tell everybody how, much, how good God is. He really, really will. But you can stop letting people affect how you act. David told his wife, you think that's bad? Wait till tomorrow see what I do. Yeah. Well, don't, don't let people hold you back. There are always be people there that want to hold you back. They'll criticize you. They will ridicule you. But you feel like God is doing to you. But you need to just put your praise on. Yeah. Would you stand your feet with me? We're, we do have a communion service as well. So just stand together with me. I'm going to put my worship on. It's a beautiful day. Yes. Praise God. I've given you the garment of praise for the spirit of Oil for morning. Beauty for action. I've given it to you. God, <coughs> I have given it to you. So it's there. It's already given. It's up to you today to reach out and receive it. Put it on. Are you here today that some things that are bothering you today, that are hindering your life? You need to allow the Spirit of God to strip those things away. Just lay those things down. 
says in the book of Hebrews to, to lay aside every weight and sin that's, that's so easily beset us. And it, it's really a picture of a runner getting ready to run the race. And you, there's, a, there's a stripping away. I, believe it or not, I ran track in high school. Yeah, I, I used to be somewhat athletic. I, I say that seriously. I still want to be, but my body tells me I can't be. Every time I jump, my neck hurts. My hip goes out. <laughs> you never believe, Pastor Kim, but yeah, I, I led her to three sports in high school. Not, not to suppose, I'm just trying to prove a point here, but in track, we'd have our warm-ups on. Before we ran the race, we'd run our race in those warm-ups. Take off, sweat, legs, take off the shirt, and we would be as light as possible to run that race. And that's what the picture is. is that God's saying that why are you going to you be weighted down with the cares of this life and the things that are going to hinder you from getting all that after you? Time for you to strip down and just put your praise on. And the wonderful thing is that when you begin to praise God, breakthrough happens. Things begin to shift and move. God invades your spot. And things begin to change. So as you stand together with me here, I've asked you to stand today because we're going to open these altars right now. Things need to change in some of your lives. You're here today and you know things need to change. And God says it's time to change. Strip, let the Spirit of God strip those things off of your life and just put on the garment. Praise. Put your praise on. So without any further asking today, I'm just going to say this. You're here today, and in your heart, you're saying, something in my life needs to change. Then I ask you very quickly to get out of your seat and come around these altars, and let us meet you here. We're going to have the ministers come and pray with you, but something in my life needs to change. I'm ready to put my praise on. If that's you today, would you quickly get out of your seat and come and find a place?